AP Biology, Second Quarter Review, Part 5. Remember that plants are going to do photosynthesis in their chloroplast. Those are the green parts inside the plant, inside the mesophyll or middle layer of the leaf. You have a double membrane, a stroma, a liquidy interior on this side, inside, thylakoids, which are the little pancakes, and uh, the stack of pancakes are called grana. The chlorophyll in the electron transport chain and the thylakoid membranes are going to be making two things. ATP and NADPH. And this is going to be an area where we're going to build up a hydrogen ion, a proton gradient. Remember, hydrogen ions and protons are the same thing. So what is that light capturing pigment all about? Well, first of all, it's called chlorophyll. And don't confuse chlorophyll with chloroplast. A chloroplast is the organelle, very large compared to, uh, to other organelles. And the chlorophyll is a molecule, very small, in comparison to the chloroplast. The chlorophyll is the green part of the chloroplast. Chlorophyll molecules have a magnesium atom in the center. This is one reason why plants need magnesium, to make their green chlorophyll. If they're deficient, they start to turn different colors. And this, this head here is kind of polar. The tails here are kind of nonpolar. And they kind of sit nice in that the membranes of the uh, thylakoid because they act kind of like a phospholipid. Remember that the chlorophyll will capture the light energy, and that's kind of important to remember. The chlorophyll is the molecule that captures light energy in plants during photosynthesis. This ring here is called a porphyrin ring. It's the head of the molecule, and that's just referring to the chlorophyll structure. Now remember that the uh, chlorophyll does not uh, capture all wavelengths of the energy. It captures mainly the wavelengths that are not green, things like purple and blue and red and orange. Now there's other accessory pigments that can capture other wavelengths of energy, but green is not very well captured uh, by plants. So when the green bounces off the plants, that's why the plants appear green. They're absorbing everything but the green. The reason why leaves change color is because the chlorophyll breaks down in cold weather, and then you see some of the accessory pigments that can also capture light, light energy, like carotene and xanthophyll. Photosystems. There's two photosystems in the thylakoids of uh, the first part of photosynthesis called light reactions. There's uh, photosystem 2 and photosystem 1. Now photosystem 2 comes first and involves a chlorophyll A molecule that captures the 680 nanometer wavelength of uh, light. The easy way to remember that 6 and 8 are both even numbers. 2 is an even number. That's the way I remember it. Photosystem 1 that comes second has a P700 chlorophyll that captures, captures a 700 nanometer wavelength of light. And if you remember, 7 is a, not 700, but the 7 is an odd number, the 1 is an odd number, and that might help you remember which one chlorophyll is involved with photosystem 1. Basically, a photon of light bounces around these um, antenna pigment molecules and eventually transferred uh, to uh, a chlor or electron uh, via the chlorophyll. So chlorophyll captures energy in the form of uh, uh, high-energy electrons and photons and uh, transfers it to uh, uh, a carrier protein. All right, make sure you know this uh, diagram. Light reactions, also called the light-dependent reactions, they depend on light, and the Calvin cycle, also called the light-independent reactions, they don't require light, and also called the dark reactions, they're all meaning the same thing. The light reactions can take the light energy, take water, bust up the water for electrons, and through photosystem 2 and photosystem 1, make a couple things. ATP, high energy molecule, used in the Calvin cycle, and NADPH, a reduced uh, molecule that also has energy to drive the Calvin cycle. Oxygen comes from the water in the light reactions, breaking apart the water in a process called photolysis to make our oxygen uh, as a waste product. You're actually breaking apart the water for electrons. Make sure that you know that water is being broken down for electrons for the light reactions. Then in the Calvin cycle, which happens in the stroma, the light reactions happen in the thylakoids, the Calvin cycle is going to take carbon dioxide gas from the, um, ultimately from the air, and combine it together and make something called P-gal. And two P-gals combined together make a glucose molecule. So the Calvin cycle is all about making the sugars. The light reaction is all about capturing light energy and making some high energy molecules that are going to be used in the Calvin cycle. Now, the energy for the Calvin cycle is going to come from the light reactions, ATP and ADPH, but the raw material from the sugars comes from carbon dioxide gas. Make sure you know what goes in and out of each of these two steps here as a general overview. 
Light reactions are similar to the electron transport chain in cell respiration. We have membrane-bound pro proteins in the organelle, carrier proteins. We have electron receptors. In plants, we have NADPH. The NADH was the only the one found in cell respiration, created by glycolysis and Krebs cycle. If it helps you remember, think of the P for photosynthesis or a P for plant, uh, because it's not used in cell respiration. Protons are moved across a uh, membrane in uh, mitochondria, we're pumping the protons into the inner membrane space. In plants, we're pumping the protons into the thylakoids. And we also have an enzyme making ATP called ATP synthase, embedded on the inner membrane of the mitochondria and on the thylakoid membrane of the chloroplast. But they both involve chemiosmosis. And here we have the electron transport chain, photosystem 2 and photosystem 1, of the little pancake, the little thylakoid here. Here's our stroma outside the thylakoid, here's our pancake. So the first step in the electron transport uh, chains of photosystem 2 and photosystem 1 is to bust apart water. This process is called photolysis, or using light to bust it apart. And um, the water is going to be broken down into oxygen, that's where the oxygen is going to be coming from, from the plant. And we're going to bust up the hydrogen into electrons and protons. Now the protons can be used to diffuse through ATP synthase, but it's really the electrons that we're getting from water that's going to be really important. So remember that. Water is providing electrons for these uh, photosystems. The electrons are going to get energy. They're going to be kicked up in energy level using the um, light captured by the chlorophyll in photosystem 2. Remember that was a P680 chlorophyll. So the light energy now transferred to the electrons. It's not light anymore. It's just an excited electron. The electron is going to um, use that energy to pump protons from the stroma to the thylakoid space. As the electrons are being passed from carrier protein to carrier protein, it's called a cytochrome complex, uh, it's going to lose its energy. And eventually, it's going to lose most of its energy and end up, end up at photosystem 1. Photosystem 2 was involved with pumping protons into this space. So the next question is, what's going to happen with these protons? These protons are going to build up, you know, form a concentration gradient, and diffuse, like water behind a dam, through ATP synthase and be used to phosphorylate ADP to make ATP. Now you're not going to make as much ATP as electron transport chain of cell respiration, but you're going to make uh, a bit for the Calvin cycle that's happening next. The hydrogen ions can be repumped back into the thylakoid space. So remember that photosystem 2 all involved with making ATP and uh, it's the first step where we um, bust apart water. Remember we got the electrons in, in uh, cell respiration from sugar the electrons in photosynthesis came from the water. Now that the electrons lost energy, we're going to kick up its energy level again using the uh, light captured by chlorophyll uh, in photosystem 1, the P700 chlorophyll, and this electro uh, electron's energy is not going to be used to pump protons and make ATP. This electron is going to reduce NADP and form NADPH. Remember, when you reduce something, you add an electron, a proton follows in living systems, electron and a proton, it's a hydrogen, so that's how we're making NADPH with the hydrogen from NADP. It's being reduced. This is a redox reaction. So the electron that came from water is now ended up in NADPH. NADPH, which has reduced energy, NADP will be used by the Calvin cycle at this point. Now, if there's no more NADP, what ends up happening is the electron gets returned back to photosystem 2. It cycles back, called cyclic electron flow, just to make more ATP, kicking up its energy level and pass along the cytochrome complex to make more hydrogen ion concentrations within the thylakoid. Cyclic electron flow is when there's no more NADP and the electron is just used to make ATP. Non-cyclic electron flow is when the electron leaves the light reactions and eventually ends up in the Calvin cycle and ultimately in sugar. And here we have another diagram basically showing the energy level. Electron energy level kicked up by the transfer of energy from chlorophyll to the electron that we got from water. Remember, breaking apart the water is called photolysis. The electron is going to lose its energy as it pumps the protons into the thylakoid space to make ATP. Losing energy, losing energy, then kicked up again by the photosystem 1's uh, transfer of energy from uh, chlorophyll. And now that energy is going to be used to reduce NADP to make NADPH. And this is called cyclic electron flow. 
if electrons leave this uh, photosystem. It's called cyclic electron flow if the electron comes back. The enzyme that reduces NADP is well named, NADP reductase, reduces NADP. So how do we know that the oxygen you know, came from water or carbon dioxide or what? Well, we use radioactive tracers, and they act the same way. It's an isotope, and that's one reason why we use isotopes, to figure out what's going on at these really small levels. We use radioactive oxygen in water, and at the end of the experiment, we end up finding out that the water's oxygen ends up in the oxygen gas given off. So, you know, think about that. The oxygen that you're breathing right now ultimately came from water being busted apart by plants. Then the second experiment, we added oxygen to carbon dioxide, radioactive oxygen, and uh, where did that oxygen end up? Well, the carbon dioxide the plant takes in is eventually going to end up in sugar. So the gas oxygen of carbon dioxide is going to end up in the sugar molecule made by the Kelvin cycle. So this is experimental evidence. You know, science is based on evidence, and this is the evidence supporting that. All right, this is the uh, next part here, the cell cycle. Remember, we do cell division to, for three reasons. Reproduction, especially if you're a unicellular uh, organism. This is the only way you make copies of yourself, by cell division. Growth, we uh, came from one cell, now we have trillions of cells. That all happened by cell division. And repair and renew. And we're going to repair, you know, damaged tissues with making these cells. Also, we're going to reproduce by a different type of cell division called uh, uh, meiosis, to produce our gametes. Remember that the cell cycle is not the birth to death of a cell. It's the life of a cell from one cell to two cells. So we have the control of the cell cycle. We start with G1. G1 plus S plus G2 is all part of the cell cycle called interphase. Inter means between. It's between cell divisions, between mitotic phase. So remember, interphase G1 plus S plus G2. During G1, we're having the cell grow a little bit. Uh, the cell was just recently made by mitosis. And uh, we're going to be doing the normal cells activities. For example, if it's a liver cell, it's detoxifying, muscle cells twitching, neuron is, um, is conducting nerve impulses. Now, some cells like neurons and muscle cells will enter something called G0, where they don't keep on dividing over and over and over again. So G0 is kind of a... Uh, part of the cell cycle where the cell is still alive, but it's just not dividing anymore. And that's kind of a problem, because if you damage your nerves, like in your spinal cord, you're not going to divide, at least not for decades. So that's kind of a um, uh, problem. We, if we can trick cells into leaving G0 to divide, or use stem cells to become nerve cells, and then they stop dividing, we might be able to solve people like, you know, not being able to walk again in wheelchairs. The next part of the cell cycle, uh, by the way, there's a G1 checkpoint here, and this is where the P53 gene is active to uh, you know, make sure that the cell's ready to move on to the next step. The S phase is about synthesis of DNA, or making the sister chromatids, or making a copy, an exact copy of the chromosomes. Remember, you don't make the DNA during mitosis. You make it way back in interphase. Mitosis is about separating out the DNA, going from one chromosome to two chromosomes but you made the DNA way back in interphase. Then after you make uh, DNA, by the end of interphase, or the S phase of interphase, you now have each chromosome consisting of two sister chromatids. Each chromosome is double-stranded. Then you're in G2. Uh, G2 is more growth, more normal cell activity, and we're also making extra organelles, so we can have enough organelles for two cells. The next step after interphase is the mitotic phase. And mitotic phase includes mitosis, PMAP, as well as cytokinesis, cell division. Once that's over, you're back at G1. Keep in mind that interphase is most of a cell cycle. We did this in the lab. About 90% of the cell cycle is in interphase. So here's an overview. We have interphase. You can't see the chromosomes distinctly. They're just called chromatin. Remember chromosomes and chromatin? Chromosomes are just DNA wrapped around histone proteins, and that's not easy to see the chromosomes when they're in interphase. During prophase, the nuclear membrane breaks down, and the chromosomes become visible. They become condensed. That's the key characteristic of prophase. We also have the centrioles moving the opposite sides, and, um, and that moves us into the next phase, called prometaphase. During prometaphase, we have the spindle fibers attaching to the little anchoring proteins at the centromere, the center part. Um, and those little anchoring proteins are called kinetic cores. Kinetic cores attach to spindle fibers during prometaphase. Then during metaphase, that's an easy one to remember, it sounds like middle phase. Now during mitosis, 
we just have a single row of chromosomes that will line up. If it was a human cell, there'd be 46 of these. The next phase is anaphase. Anaphase is when the sister chromatids separate at the centromere, and now they're called their own chromosomes. Temporarily, you have 92 chromosomes during anaphase because you haven't divided the cell yet, but um, you uh, now have uh, the two sets or two of every uh, chromosome going to opposite cells. The uh, last phase, telophase, we have uh, new nuclear membranes forming as well as the chromosomes starting to disperse. And that ends part five of your review.